Hello. In this video, we're going to learn how to write the basic unit of a program that allows us to sample a Markov chain. We will see that writing a function to sample a discrete time Markov chain is straightforward if you already know how to write a program to generate a multinomial trial. We have covered this idea of generating multiple tri multinomial trials in previous exercises, but we will start this video by revising this algorithm so that we can then apply it in the context of sampling a Markov chain. Any discrete random variable has a probability mass function like the one shown here. The heights of the bars in the graph here represent the probabilities of getting the outcomes that are shown on the x-axis on the graph. Consequently, if we add the heights of all the bars in the probability mass function together, we get 1. If we know that the probability mass function for the random variable, we can generate a random variable from the distribution using the algorithm that I will discuss here. As I have explained in the previous videos, when explaining this algorithm, I like to imagine that we take the bars of the probability mass function and lie them side by side to generate a line segment with a total length of 1. In drawing this line segment, I draw each bar of the probability mass function in a different colour. You can then see that the blue part of this segment that starts at zero and ends at the probability of getting a zero, the green part of this segment starts at the probability of getting a zero and ends at the probability of getting a zero plus the probability of getting a one. And then there is there are only three possible outcomes. The red part of the line ends at one. Notice importantly that the blue segment of the line has a length that is proportional to the probability of getting a zero, the green part of the line has a length that is proportional to the probability of getting a one, and the red part of the line has a prob probability, a length that is pro proportional to the probability of getting a two. In our code for generating a random variable from this distribution, we start by generating a uniform continuous random variable that is between 0 and 1. As this variable has a uniform distribution, the probability that it falls within the blue segment of the line is proportional to the length of the blue segment, which is the probability of getting a 0. We thus check if our uniform random variable is less than the probability of getting a 0, and if it is, we return the value of the random variable as zero. The probability that the random variable forms within the green segment of the line is proportional to the length of that segment of the line. The length of that segment of the line is proportional to the probability of getting a one. Within our function we can thus check if u is less than p0 plus p1 to check if we are in the green segment and if we are, we can return a 1 in this case. Notice that this second statement is checking if u is greater than p0 and less than p0 plus p1. If u was less than p0, we would already have returned from the code and we would never have evaluated the truth value of this second proposition in this second if statement. If neither of the two if statements have been triggered, then u must fall within the red segment of the line. This segment has a length that is proportional to the probability of getting a 2. We can thus return 2 in this final case. The code on the previous slide that is repeated here only works if there are three outcomes for our trial. In that code on the previous slide, we pass two scalars to the function. These two scalars are the probability of getting a 1 and the probability of getting 0. We can avoid the need to pass two scalars and we can begin to generalize our function by instead 
passing the probability information in a numpy array as shown here. So we have a numpy array here that holds the entire probability mass function. This code still only works for random variables that have two pos three possible outcomes though, because we are using if statements. We could add more if statements if there are more outcomes for our random variables, but given that our philosophy is always to avoid, avoid writing long codes, there must be some better way of achieving the same outcome with fewer lines of code. The function shown here provides a better way of generating a multinomial random variable. Once again, the argument to the function is a vector that contains the elements of the probability mass function for the random variable of interest. Now, however, this vector of probability mass values can have any length because we use this while loop inside the function. To understand why this while loop works, let's consider the segmented line from the previous slide once more. The function starts by generating a uniform continuous random variable that is between 0 and 1, called u, just as the function at the top of the slide does. For illustrative purposes, we will suppose that u fell here on our segmented line. Our random variable should thus be equal to 2. Let's consider why the return value for the function will be 2 in this case in order to understand why the function works. The first step in understanding why the function will return 2 in this case is recognising that the return value for the function is the variable n. As shown here, this variable is initially set equal to 0 and is incremented every time you pass through the while loop. The value of n that is returned thus essentially counts the number of times that the while loop has been passed through. Notice that the proposition that is used to decide whether to make another passage through the while loop is the u is greater than a cube, which is shown here. Further note that a cube is initially set equal to prob 0, the probability of getting a 0. Consequently, if our random variable u falls into the blue segment of the line, the while loop is never entered, n is never incremented, and a value of 0 will be returned as it should be. For illustrative purposes, however, we are supposing that u fell within the red segment of the line. We thus enter the while loop and increase by n by 1. We then add probs 1 to a cube and shift its value from the end of the blue line to the end of the green segment, as shown here. We are now back at the while loop, and u is still greater than a cube, so we pass through the loop again. n is increased to 2, and probs 2 is added to a cube. The value of a cube is now as shown here. Now the proposition in the while loop is no longer true, and we thus break out of the loop, and the function returns 2, as it should. Great, so we now have an algorithm to generate a discrete random variable with any probability mass function that we so choose. But what does this have to do with sampling a Markov chain? Well, consider the transition matrix that is shown here. Every single row in this matrix is a probability mass function. If we know what state we are currently in, we can thus use the algorithm that we have just written to generate the next step state in the chain. Cool, huh? Before we get on to writing the code to generate our Markov moves, we just have to put the information in this matrix into Python. 
We can do this using the NPArray command that is shown here. Each row in the transition matrix is entered into square brackets as shown here, and then these three sets of numbers in square brackets are placed in a comma separated list. This then all needs to be surrounded by another set of square brackets as shown here, and then the whole thing is placed inside an NP array command. A is thus our is as a variable that holds our transition matrix. Once we have set up our transition matrix in Python, we can write the following function to generate the next step in our Markov chain. This function works exactly like the function that we have just written for sampling multinomial trials. Importantly, however, the function now has two arguments. The first of these arguments, A, is the transition matrix. The second argument is the state that we are currently in, S. As an aside, the fact that we have to pass the state that we are in to a function that generates a move in a Markov chain shouldn't really surprise us. We know from the Markov property that the future behaviour of the system depends on the current state of the system. If we didn't have to provide information on the current state of the system to the function for generating a Markov chain, we would thus have some serious doubts as to whether what was being sampled really was a Markov chain. Now notice how the state that we are currently in is used in the code. The variable s is essentially used to determine which row of the matrix is being used as the distribution we are sampling a multinomial trial from. Remember that each row of this matrix contains a sort of probability mass function. The rest of the code here thus works exactly like the code that we have just discussed for generating multinomial trials. And that is pretty much it. If we want to generate a chain, Markov chain of 10 variables, we might write a code, something like the one shown here, that calls our function Markov move 10 times. Notice that S appears on both sides of the expression here. The next time we call Markov move, we are thus moving from the state that we just arrived in to a new state. And that's all there is to sampling a Markov chain. I hope that's pretty clear. Thanks for your attention and good luck with the exercise.